So hi everybody again. Uh, welcome to the uh, integra Integrating with Google Apps session. Uh, so today we'll talk about Google Apps as a developer platform and you know, what has launched in the past few months and, and especially where the platform is going in general uh, in, in, you know, in the upcoming years. So quickly, first, uh, let me quickly present myself. So my name is Nicolas Garnier. I'm a developer advocate at Google and I joined in uh, 2008. Uh, I'm located in Zurich, um, not far from here. Uh, my Twitter is at Nifco, though I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm a bit more active on Google Plus. Uh, and my profile, you can access my profile through plus.nicolasgarnier.com. Um, and, you know, feel free to, you know, send me feedback about the session or just chat with me in general. Uh, I would appreciate that a lot. So the agenda. Uh, so we're first going to do a very, very quick uh, Google Apps overview for the ones that don't know uh, Google App, what Google Apps is in general. Uh, then we'll talk about the Tasks API and the future of our APIs, see how that impacts the future of our APIs. Uh, then we're going to talk about what's new in AppScript. Uh, we'll talk quickly about the Picker API, which is a new API we, we, just, we launched a few months ago. And then we'll talk about the distribution opportunities. So first, uh, let's see who knows what Google Apps is, or they think they know. <laughs> All right, that's pretty good. Um, Actually, when I joined the Google Apps team, I was like a bit confused between Google Apps, Google Docs, you know, uh, what's the difference, that kind of things. So for the ones that don't know exactly what Google Apps is, uh, we're first going to do a very quick Google App overview. So uh, this is for the one that attended the Google App Engine talk, probably seen that already. So that's the uh, cloud computing model defined by Gartner. Uh, it's made of three layers. So the, the lowest layer is infrastructure as a service. So it's basically companies who provide you know, machines or a low-level infrastructure. Uh, one of the most known, of course, is Amazon EC2, for example. Uh, the second layer that's built on top of that is platform as a service. So it's simply um, you know, companies that provide a way to simply host your application. And you just run your application, run your code without worrying about uh, machines uh, per se. And the last layer is software as a service. Uh, so that's where Google Apps is. Uh, Google Docs, Google Spreadsheet, Google Calendar, etc. All the Google Apps suite. So it's simply software that run in the cloud. You can access them through a um, through a web browser, etc. So, uh, which is probably one of the most known um, layer of, of this of this uh, stack. So Google Apps, a few metrics. Um, it's three million businesses running on Google Apps. 4,000 new businesses signing up each day, and that was actually last year's number, so end of 2010. So now it, it actually accelerated quite a bit. So these metrics are a bit outdated. We don't have the new metrics yet, but you can extrapolate these. Uh, it's, it's actually a bit, uh, a bit more now. Um, it's 40 million active users, uh, and you know, we launched 200 new features in 2010. That's through all our products, all the products that are part of the Google Apps Suite, uh, and we provide a 99.9 .9 uptight guarantee for the companies using Google Apps. So Google Apps is basically all our consumer products uh, brought to your company. So you can take Gmail, Google Calendar, Google Sites, etc. Those are all products that we provide to the consumer. Um, and we just, we're going to offer it to, a comp to companies, to enterprise, uh, who want to, to use that as their collaboration tools uh, and communication tools. And we're going to offer that in a branded way. So you're going to have Gmail uh, you know, with your logo, with your uh, your, your URL, I mean your domain, for example, if you are the owner of mycompany.com, you're going to get a Gmail uh, hosting your at mycompany.com emails. So this is Google Apps, a uh, very, uh, very quick way to define it. Uh, and Google Apps is part of the 100% web for business view that we'd like to defend at Google. So where companies would use Google Apps for all their co collaboration and communication needs, uh, and they will build uh, their custom apps on the cloud and use third-party apps that are running on the cloud. Basically, having all of their solutions, all of the, all of the applications they use, hosted on the cloud. And uh, you would simply use you know, your web browser or your mobile devices to, to access them. Very simple. And um, so now if we take you know, the pyramid back and just focus on the Google's cloud offering without you know, removing all the other companies, uh, this is what we get. We, have, we offer some infrastructure as a service, uh, Google Storage, Prediction API, BigQuery. These are low-level infrastructure. I uh, already talked about Google App Engine for the platform as a service. Um, and for the software as a service, this is where we have Google Apps. I said it already. 
but we also want to, to you know, think of third-party apps and Google Apps Marketplace apps and, and your application as part of our offering. Uh, why? Because your application or third-party application could integrate so tightly with Google Apps that uh, you know, when our sales representative go and try to sell Google Apps, they could say, listen, we offer you the Google Apps Suite, what uh, Google actually builds, but there's also all these other cool applications that integrate so tightly with Google Apps um, uh, that it's going to be a very, very nice experience. It's going to seem as it's part of the Google Apps Suite. Um, so this is what we want you to build, uh, these kind of apps that integrate so tightly with Google Apps that they're just part of our offering. They're just seen as seen as you know, Google's cloud offering in general. And for you to build these applications that integrate tightly with Google Apps, uh, we're going to provide you key tools. Uh, so a bunch of tools for you to program programmatically access uh, our data and, and easily build um, uh, tools that integrate very tightly with Google Apps. So the first category of these tools is a way to customize UI. So we offer you, for example, ways to build gadgets or um, that are integrated into Gmail or integrated into Calendar or just standalone that can live into Google Sites. Uh, we offer you, for example, the, um, uh, the Charts API, also the Google Sites API for you to programmatically create websites. Uh, we also have this new feature. We're going to talk about that in a moment. Uh, the new graphical user interface uh, that ships with App Script, uh, which is a really cool and easy way to build UIs. Uh, so. We're going to offer you this, um, uh, all these tools to actually build, uh, easily build UIs. Uh, the second category is a way for you to manipulate business objects, basically manipulate the user data. Uh, so one of the most known ones, for example, the Contacts API or the Calendar API, those are the most used. Uh, all what we call Google Data APIs. These are uh, APIs that are you know, going to allow you to in, like, sorry, integrate with our products, with the data of our products. So uh, create new data, just download the new data, modify it, etc. So very simple, with, with contacts, you can create Google contacts inside Gmail. Uh, you can download the contacts of the user, etc. So ways to manipulate uh, user data. And the last one is ways for you to build your own custom business logic. So uh, it's basically the platform, kind of the platform as a service. Uh, layer where we have Google App Engine, you can simply run uh, your own application that you build yourself uh, using, you know, your stack and your client libraries, etc. And uh, of course, App Script. Uh, for the ones that don't know App Script, we'll, we'll do a, a quick overview and a quick demo later on during this talk. Uh, App Script, which also lets you, you know, programmatically, I mean, create your own business logic and programmatically access all our APIs. And the last, uh, the last point is we are, are going to allow you to access the identity of the user and, and manipulate you know, access control list to, to you know, access all our product uh, in a fine-grained way. Uh, and now let's talk a bit about the Task API, which we launched a few months ago at Google I.O. So uh, who uses Google Tasks in the room? Nobody? Okay, a few people, that's good. Uh, you know, Google Tasks is this little widget uh, that's inside Gmail where it lets you, you know, add your tasks, uh, your to-dos, basically. It's also integrated into Google Calendar. <coughs> so the Task API, why is it important? Uh, because, so the Task API is built on our new API infrastructure. So a few months ago, actually, you know, this year, uh, early this year, we launched a new infrastructure for hosting our APIs, uh, which bring a tons of new characteristics to our API. The Task API is one of the first APIs within the Google Apps Suite to integrate uh, with this infrastructure. Um, and it's important because all our upcoming APIs and all the new versions of our uh, you know, former APIs are going to be built on this new infrastructure and are going to have similar characteristics. Um, so all I'm going to talk about today about the Task API is valid for all our upcoming APIs. And it's also valid for a bunch of our APIs that are already launched, which are not part of the we don't call them part of the Google Apps Suite, for example, the, the Google Plus API, the URL Shortener API, etc. All these APIs have similar characteristics uh, as the Tasks API, uh, because they all have been built on the new infrastructure. So what kind of characteristics do they have? Well, first, uh, they are RESTful APIs, and they are built, uh, they're using the JSON format to exchange data. Uh, they have a set of client library, for example, the Java, .NET, Python, PHP, and Ruby client library. 
um, which are very, very similar and work very well in a very similar way across all our APIs and, and all the different languages as well. We'll see that in a moment. Uh, they also all integrate with, I mean, use OAuth2 as the <coughs> authorization mechanism um, to access, you know, restricted and protected resources. They will have uh, a cool feature called partial response and update, which we'll also see in a moment um, how that works. And they all integrate with the API console, the API explorer, and the discovery service. We'll also see that in a, in a few moments. So first, let's, let's see you know, how task, the task API works. Uh, so these are the two resources that you can find in, the, in tasks, basically. For the ones that use tasks, that's very familiar. That's, this, that's simply the widget you can see inside Gmail or inside Google Calendar. Um, on the left, you have the task lists. The task, task lists are just lists of tasks, and you can have you know, multiple ones uh, and display the one you want. Uh, on the right, you have tasks, uh, and each task can have like a bunch of um, a bunch of data into it. Like they have notes, uh, they have a due date. Uh, you can uh, you can set whether they are finished or not, etc. A bunch of different characteristics. And the task API model is of course very very similar. So when you look at the task list, it's going to be a simple uh, object with two attributes, ID and title, um, and it's going to also contain a bunch of tasks. And each task has also a list of attributes, ID, title, status, parent, and position. Um, you know, these are the two resources that you find in the task API. So you know, it's a REST model, so you have resources and collections. And you can access the collections of each of these resources through the URLs that are listed here. So if you send, for example, a get request to these URL endpoints um, in the bottom uh, here, you'll get the list of task list. And if you send a get request to the URL endpoints that you see here on the right, you'll get the list of tasks. And this is the full uh, API, the full task API methods that, um, that are available in the task API. Uh, I'm not going to go through it. It's just if you have a closer look later on, you'll see that it really well respects uh, the REST architectural style. It's just in general, all our APIs are going to be very, very restful. Uh, we haven't been so good with all our APIs in the past. We're trying to let, you know, have really, really good uh, REST architectural style in the, in the future. A little word about our client libraries. So you can see on the left, uh, this is the way to get the default task list. So all the, the tasks that are inside the default task list using the protocol. So you can see that's a very uh, I mean, it's not an easy process. You have to build a JS I mean, uh, send a sorry an HTTP request uh, to that URL endpoint, then parse the JSON response. It can take a bit of time. So of course, you wouldn't have to do that. Usually, you'd simply use one of our client libraries. Um, you can see here the Java and the PHP client libraries. The same example here, where we just get a default task list. Uh, it's simply a one-liner. So in one line, you can get the default, default task list. Whereas usually you would have to send a request, parse the JSON response, etc., and then you can parse through your tasks in a you know really uh, easy and uh, uh, you know uh, programmatic way. I mean, way to do that in Java and PHP, for example. Um, all our other client libraries, uh, the Ruby, the .NET, etc., uh, all look alike. For all our you know sorry. All, you can all use them in a very similar way. Uh, you can see the Java and the PHP client library here are uh, kind of architectured in a very similar way. So once you know how to use one, it's very, very easy to understand how the other one works. It's also very easy to use other APIs, uh, you know, not tasks, but for example, Google+. They all work and, and are architectured in a very similar way. Um, now I've talked a bit about the you know, API console. Uh, how, how, that, how the new API is integrated with it. I'm going to do a quick demo of this. So the API console is the first place where you should go when you want to integrate uh, with our APIs. So <coughs> that's where you actually register your project and let us know that you're a developer and you want to use our APIs. So this is the first place you should go. It's actually usually listed in the doc. Uh, I mean, it, the doc lets you know where to find this, but uh, for the one that have a good memory, you can find it at code.google.com slash APIs slash console. Uh, the first thing you would do is obviously create a new project. Uh, you can access it through the little menu here, create. Uh, here I've already created the project for us. 
Uh, then the second thing you need to do is enable APIs. Oh, <coughs> sorry, I have to reload this page. It's been open for too long. <coughs> Here in the services list. So this, these are the list of all our APIs that integrate with our new architecture and which are available in the APIs console. So when you, need, when you want to use them, you have to go to the APIs console and create a project and then enable these APIs. Uh, you can see the Buzz API, the Google Plus API, etc. So if I wanted to use, and if I want to use the task API, I just have to, you know, click the toggle and enable it here on. What uh, the API console is going to give you is also ways to track uh, your resources. Uh, I mean, the usage of your APIs. You, you have a report, um, a report section here where you're going to see the usage of your APIs over time. Uh, so this is really practical, especially if you're building applications like an Android app, uh, where you don't always go through your backend, <coughs> through a backend server, where it's actually a client application accessing the API directly. You don't always know how much of the API they're using, and so this tool is very, very practical in that way. Uh, this is also where you're going to, uh, you know, set, uh, set quotas. So if you go to the quota section here, uh, you're going to see you can set per user quota, so your application is given a quotas limit uh, by default, a free quotas limit. For example, for the task API, your application can only send 5,000 requests a day. This is where you go when you want to request more quota. So we do grant more quota and it's free. So don't be scared if you have a, a really good use case and, want to, and you need a lot more than the quotas limit for the APIs, you simply click on that link. Uh, it's sometimes a form, sometimes other ways. And, and then we're gonna you know, grant you more quotas. Uh, uh, you can also, as I said, set a per user limit so that a particular user is not, you know, going to use all your quota for your application. Oh, let's go back. So that was the APIs console. Uh, there is another tool that all our APIs integrate, integrate with, all the new uh, style APIs running on the new infrastructure. It's the APIs Explorer. Oh, sorry, it's here. So the API Explorer is basically uh, some kind of playground that's going to let you play around with uh, all our APIs that integrate with the new infrastructure. Um, so I'm just going to use it with the task API a little bit. So you can see, uh, again, the list of all our APIs that are running on the new infrastructure are here. Uh, if I want to use the task API, I'm go simply going to click on it. Automatically detect there is the only one version of the task, version one of the API, version one. And then, for example, I could list all my task lists. Click Execute. Oh, I need to switch to private access. So this is going to use OS2 and, and authenticate, uh, uh, authorize, sorry, using the, the OS2 client flow to give access to the, play, sorry, to the API Explorer to access my own data. So if I click here, uh, the API Explorer is going to show you everything that happened um, on the HTTP level. So you're going to see the HTTP request here and the response, what it looks like. So here you see if I wanted to get the list of my task lists. Uh, <coughs> sorry, it's a GET request to that endpoint. Uh, it shows you all the header, the authorization, the OS2 authorization header. It shows you the response. Here we got a 200 OK and I have two task lists. Uh, one is called Stuff to Do and the other, way, the other one is called Nicholas's List. Uh, if I want to list uh, all the tasks that I have in my task list, I can just go to tasks.list. I want to list everything that's in the default task list, for example. And so this, these are all my tasks. So I have to speak at GDD Prague, uh, which is what I'm currently doing. I have to buy some souvenir and uh, you know visit Prague. So you guys can give me ideas about buy some souvenirs, though, because uh, what's good here except beer? <laughs> yeah, you, have <laughs> you have those crystal things. I see crystal shops everywhere. Maybe I'm going to buy that um, if I don't get a better idea. So now let's see. I want to tick a task. I mean, ma mark a task as completed. Uh, what I could do here is first copy paste this first task, this is, which is the one I'm going to mark as completed. Up, then I'm going to do a task dot update. She's going to update my task. Up, add a request body. I'm simply going to copy paste my task, mark it as completed. 
So in REST, you have to send the whole element back uh, to update it. And it's in the add default task list. And I have to copy paste the ID of the task, which is this one. So if I didn't uh, screw things up, this is going to work very nicely. Up. 200 OK. Perfect. Completed. And now if I go to Gmail, for example, I have my list of tasks here. I'm simply, simply going to refresh it. And hopefully you see here. So the API Explorer just updated the tasks speak at GDD Prague. That all worked great. So that was the API Explorer. You can use it to uh, you know, play around with a bunch of other APIs. You should really go and, and try it out. It's, it's really convenient. Um, one of the other features I want to speak about is partial response and update. So one of the things that not great in REST is that it's not very resource efficient. Uh, when you want to actually uh, get an object, get a resource, you have to get the whole resource. And when, when you need to update a resource, you also have to send the whole resource with the updated fields. Um, this is what we're trying to fix uh, with the partial response and update um, uh, feature. Uh, what the partial response lets you do is, sorry, let me go to full screen, up, is uh, let you, let you, is gonna let you define which fields you want to download. I mean, which fields only you wanna get, which information you wanna get as part of the resource. And this is done using the fields URL parameter. Um, here you're gonna set, um, we're gonna use the fields parameter to only get uh, the list of tasks that, uh, and only their ID and only their title. And you know, skip the rest, the other information, which is, uh, for example, is it completed, the notes, etc. We, we just want the title and we just want the ID. So if you send a get request to um, <coughs> our URL endpoint, uh, this is the response you're gonna get here as an example. Uh, only the ID and only the title of all the tasks. We also have this, um, I mean, the same thing with update. Uh, it's simply called patch. So what you're going to do here is instead of sending a put request, uh, you, you only have to send, I mean, you have to send a patch request. And we're only going to update the attributes with which you set in the body. So uh, here's a way, for example, to only update the notes of a particular task. What, what you would have to do uh, if you use a put is send the whole task. So with the ID, with the... Uh, the name, the title, is it completed, etc., cetera, um, and the changed notes, uh, this is way more uh, resource efficient. So if you're on, a, for example, uh, building your application on a mobile phone and you know, you're restricted um, uh, you know, network-wise, uh, you should use partial response and partial update. Uh, this is actually, I mean, using this feature, you can save a lot of, um, a lot of bandwidth. <coughs> One of the later, uh, last um, thing I want to talk about, uh, about the, you know, this new API infrastructure, is the discovery service. So the discovery service is a way to programmatically de get the descriptions of APIs. Uh, it's basically an API about APIs itself. So um, you can query it to get information about each of our APIs and know how they work. Uh, and it's an API running on our new infrastructure. You're going to see on the next slide why, why it's important. Uh, but first, it will you know, let you find, you know, uh, the whole list of our APIs. Uh, you, also, you can also get the resource sch schema. So get a JSON schema of each of the APIs entities, I mean APIs resources, uh, I mean resources that are available in the APIs. You can get the list of API methods, the, the, all the parameters, uh, which one are mandatory, which one are not. You can get the list of URL endpoints, uh, the list of OAuth2 scopes, um, and inline documentations for each of the methods. Um, by the way, if you'd like to know more about OAuth2, Ryan here in the front row, raise your hand, Ryan, <laughs> is giving a talk about OAuth2 and OpenID. I think it's um, after lunch, uh, just after lunch. Uh, so if you're interested into the, this authorization uh, mechanism, uh, which is really important, um, you, should, you should show up at his talk. So let's try the discovery service. It's actually very easy to use because you don't need to authenticate or anything, all you have to do is simply send a GET request uh, to the discovery service. So this is how you would get, for example, the title, the name, and the versions of all our APIs which run on the new infrastructure. So I said it's itself, it's an API running on the new infrastructure. Why is it important? Because you can also use, for example, partial. 
partial uh, partial get. So here in this case, um, this this method here just use partial. I just want the title, the name, and the version, and skip all the other information. So let me show you. So if I send, if I simply open that URL in my browser, here's what I get. Uh, I'm going to get a list of basically all our APIs, uh, the new infrastructure APIs. So at Exchange Buyer, Analytics, version 2.4, version 3, Audit, Blogger, Books, Buzz, etc. So these are all our APIs. If I remove the field zero parameter, which is the partial get, so you get a lot more information. You'll get a description of the API, you'll get an icon, uh, you know, an ID, etc. So you can get lots lots of useful information. The documentation link also very useful. <clears throat> There's also uh, another endpoint here is uh, a per API endpoint. So you can get even more details um, in the per API endpoint. So here I used, um, sorry, I used the partial get again to simply get the OS2 scopes. So if you want just the OS2 scope of a particular API, uh, you could simply run that uh, URL here. And, and here, in that example, I'm getting the tasks uh, OS2 scopes. So there is a read-write one and a read-only one. So I can show you all the information you could get. You could get a bunch, a bunch. And very importantly, uh, you would get the, the JSON schema here. So uh, you can prog programmatically get all the information about uh, the API, how it's architectured, how each uh, particular resource um, I mean, all the attributes of each particular resource, uh, which attributes are mandatory, etc. Which type they are. So it's a very powerful way to get meta information. And that allows you to build developer tools. So we actually use uh, this service to build the API Explorer, for example, uh, and also to build client libraries. So if I go back to the API Explorer, up here, uh, all that you've seen here is generated basically on the fly querying the, 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 API, uh, the API resource, um, sorry, the API for a service to, um, to get the list of all the methods and all the attributes, which one are mandatory. Uh, there's no actually human listing here. This is all done programmatically uh, using the discovery service. And also for our client libraries, uh, if you take the Java or our .NET client libraries, these are generated. So we have, uh, we simply run a process which is going to use the discovery service to generate these client libraries. Uh, so whenever our client libraries get updated, for example, we add, uh, we add a new URL endpoint with new elements, uh, we simply have to run a process and the client library will get automatically generated from this discovery service. And also dynamic languages such as Python, uh, for example, are actually going to do this on the fly. So when you run the, for the first time the Python client library, um, it's, it's going to use the discovery service to get the structure of the API and know how to parse, I mean, know where the, your endpoints are, know how to create the JSON, uh, the JSON object and, the, and how to parse the JSON response uh, automatically on the fly. So think about how all you could do with this kind of discovery service. So if you yourself are building an API for your company, uh, maybe you should also build a discovery service. Think about how powerful that could be. Uh, you could basically almost simply take the code of our API Explorer and you know, run it against your discovery service for your API, and that would simply work. That would be great. So now let's, um, let's talk a bit about AppScript. And what's new in AppScript, especially what have we launched in the past few months? So first, who knows what AppScript is? Okay, not too many people, like five, yes. Uh, so have you guys already used AppScript or you just know what it is? Who have really used it? The same people, okay. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so AppScript is a JavaScript engine in the cloud. So um, it's a way for us to execute your own, I mean, the JavaScript you write uh, on our Google Cloud and it's gonna integrate very tightly with Google APIs. Uh, it's, it's really awesome and great for workflow uh, and process automation. So you could, uh, in you know, a few lines of code, you know, automate your workflow, automate some of the tasks that, are, that, that you would find re very repetitive uh, in your everyday work or in your company. So one of the latest, latest uh, you know, services that we launched is the Gmail service. So uh, you probably know how it works already. If you know Gmail, who uses Gmail in the room? Hope it's everybody. Okay, who doesn't use it? Okay, who was ashamed of raising his hand? 
that's the second question. Okay, <laughs> two people. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, so, <clears throat> so if you use Gmail, you already know how the API works. Basically, it lets you compose, um, compose email, lets you search your inbox, uh, lets you send email, you know, modify the labels, uh, reply all, etc. Everything you can do inside Gmail, you can do programmatically using that API, which runs on, on the App Script platform. Um, so there are just three objects, Gmail thread, message, and label. You know, a thread just contains of messages, and labels can be applied to threads. And this is a bit of code here. Uh, as you can see, it's, it's very, it just looks like JavaScript. It's JavaScript syntax uh, for the people who haven't used uh, App Script. Um, and what we're going to do here is simply search our inbox for all the unread emails. So the, the first method here, it's simply going to return us a list of threads uh, which, are, which contain a, a message which is not read. And what the method here is going to do is simply return all the messages. I mean, go through the threads, add them to an array, and return all the messages that are part of an unread thread. So I have a quick demo to show you how that works. Is, so here is a um, spreadsheet. Uh, usually, App Script lives inside spreadsheets. So this is where you can find the App Script editor. I'm going to open it for you. Up since not a lot of people uh, know about App Script. Um, as you can see, there is an unopened method. It's triggered when you open the, the spreadsheet. It simply creates this little menu here. You can add menus to, to spreadsheet. And what I'm going to do here is the, um, pretty much the same thing, is I'm going to you know, read all the unread email in my inbox. What I'm going to do, uh, instead of just returning the list of messages, is print them here uh, in my spreadsheet and create a link to the email and count the, the number of words which, which is inside the email. So let's just run it. Here you go. So I have three unread emails. Uh, one person fo is following me on Twitter. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Pavel. Um, and see, we just counted the word just to let you know that you can read the content of the email and, and, and apply, I mean, do programmatic things on it, you know, apply your own logic. The other feature. Um, that we launched a few months ago is Document App. It's basically uh, a way to programmatically access any Google Documents uh, inside, uh, well, inside Google Docs. Uh, you can create new documents, you can copy existing ones, open my ID, then you can compose them, you can you know, access the document body, create paragraph, footers, etc. Modify that inside App Script. So what that lets you do is, for example, create templates. Uh, so what you can do now with App Script is, for example, create a Google Docs like this with placeholders for values. For example, here is amount, rate, duration. So I have a little example for us. This is it. Uh, this is um, just a template for a mortgage quote uh, where you, we have placeholders for the home value, the loan amount, the interest rate, and the monthly payments. And what you could do with App Script is simply copy this document and modify the placeholders, and you know, apply programmatic logic. For example, send that by email to a bunch of people, etc. So here is a little script to process the template. What this does is this gets the um, the document itself. You have to give it the ID and make a copy of it. Then simply open it, replace the text within the placeholder, and return the copy of it. So it's simply copying the copying the document and replacing the values. Oh, I had a little example for this. Mm -hmm. I forgot to open it. Here it is. Let me remove this. So I have to wait here. I, get, uh, I created a little menu. So when I read this method, it, it's what it's going to do. It's simply going to um, up. I needed all these values. It's simply going to copy the document you've just seen and replace the placeholder with the values I've inserted in my spreadsheet here. And it's going to give me a link to that new document. So let me just run this. It takes a little bit, you know, the time the API copies the document. Here we got the first one, the second one. So if I open the first one now, it's a copy of the template we've seen with all the values modified. So it's a you know, using App Script now, you can very, very simply and very quickly create templates and uh, customize these templates, send them out, or, or do anything you want with this. Up. 
So another new API that we launch is the Charts API. Uh, so the Charts API just gives you programmatic access to uh, Google Charts, so you can uh, use your own data that you have in your spreadsheet or that you got through any other way, and very simply create charts. And here's how you do it. So you simply build a data table. Uh, it's a you know bidimensional array where uh, you give a uh, I mean you create first the columns and then add rows of data. And then you pass that to the charts API, which is how you would do it usually. Choose the new column charts. Uh, you could you know set the colors of the columns, etc. So it's very uh, I mean you can very easily um, uh, you know modify all the values of this and. Now let me just show you a quick example. Oh, I think it's here. So this is the same, oh, it's refreshing. Uh, so here is the, uh, the same example that you've seen in the slide. So the same data, simply um, uh, you know, values of income and expenses per quarter. You know, if you're a company, you'd like to make these graphs, how much you've spent per quarter, how much, you've, uh, uh, how many, how much income did you get. And what I've done here is I've taken my script and published it as a published it as a service. So what that lets you do that lets you um, get I mean create a standalone app using App Script uh, and that that people can access. So you don't have to open a spreadsheet and execute a script. People could just ac access this UI and um, you know in a standalone way. And basically it lets you just build you know really simple programs. Uh, uh, with a small user interface in a very quick way in JavaScript and access, you know, a bunch of Google APIs through that. Um, and, you know, in order to do that, we also launched the UL Builder uh, a little time ago. So in the, in the preceding example, I've simply, re you know, uh, returned a, um, a graph. Uh, what you can do here is build full uh, UIs you know, with buttons, uh, fields, etc., let people input their own values uh, and run your own logics using triggers. Uh, you know, all that with a WYSIWYG editor. So very, very simple again. So here is a way to get uh, the, the actual UI component that you've created before. So when you save your UI component that you've created manually through the WYSIWYG editor, uh, you give it a name and then you can simply load it through the app.load component then you can actually modify it again. For example, add new component programmatically or um, add graphs, uh, add any sort of other uh, UI components that you'd like and, and return that. So that's how you, you create a standalone service. Uh, it's you know, building these UIs and just returning them in the do get method. <clears throat> and we have a demo that uses actually all the, all the features that we've just seen in, the, I mean, in these past slides. Uh, it's a mortgage calculator. So let me just show you here. So what it does is, um, let me move it a bit on the right so you can see it correctly. What it does is simply lets you enter your email, enter your home value and your loan amount uh, and the length of your loan, I mean of your, of your mortgage. And it's good, you know, create a chart, a chart of the mortgage and actually email the document that we've seen earlier to your email. So let's just simply try that out gonna ins insert my personal email and let's say I want to buy a home you know that cost hundred thousand dollars it's a pretty cheap home and I need to actually borrow ninety thousand dollars of this over 30 years if I click the submit button what it's doing right now is generating a graph um, for the monthly payment interest versus principal so this is you know uh, if you have a fixed uh, you know loan to reimburse every month, uh, how, how, what part of this is you know, principal versus interest, and it actually sends us a quote of this mortgage on my email. So if I go back to my email and I refresh it, here you go, we got Steve Mortgage. We got a quote, and what it did, it generated a PDF from the Google Docs that we've seen earlier. And let me just view it. And that PDF is the mortgage quote that, I mean, the template that we've seen with all the, the values replaced. So this is the kind of things you can very, very easily do with App Script. Uh, one of the other new things that we launched. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Thank you for App Script. <laughs> so one of the other things that, uh, that we launched a few months ago is the Picker API. The Picker API is... Um, 
a simple JavaScript API that you can integrate, uh, I mean, that lets you integrate a way to select Google documents uh, in your website, but just in a, with a few lines of, uh, of JavaScript. So it's simply going to pop up that kind of UI here and lets your users select Google documents or other Google resources. It can be images or YouTube videos. And then it's going to return this, uh, I mean, you know, the elements that has been selected uh, back to your application, in, you know, in a JavaScript way. So this is how you would integrate the Picker API. Uh, very simple. You, you just have to, you know, load uh, the Picker API. It uses the load, uh, I mean, the Google JavaScript API importer. Um, running this method here, you would simply create a picker. Uh, you can see it's, it's actually, um, I mean, you can uh, configure it pretty easily here. I've set it up to only let people pick up, uh, pick Google Docs. Uh, this is where you can set it up to pick, I mean, so that your user can pick uh, YouTube videos or, or images or, uh, or also upload documents. There's an upload feature which is really, really, um, which is actually very useful. And then you set a callback. So when your user has finished picking up, uh, uh, picking up the element inside the UI, it's going to, you know, call that callback and let you know which element has been picked up, has been picked. Sorry. So um, in that case, you can access, for example, the URL of the of the element, and um, uh, also the API lets you actually select multiple elements, not only one, etc. So I have a little demo for you. What I've did is I, I used very, very similar code that what we've just seen in the preceding uh, slides. Up here it is. And you know, by simply clicking this button, it's gonna open the, the picker API. And you know, okay, let's let's select one of the copy of the GDD demo templates that we have created in one of the previous API uh, demos. So if I select that, have you seen we can access, you know, the, the name of the element, uh, the URL as well. If I click, it's simply going to open uh, the template. But what, it also, what it's also going to give you, not only this, it's going to give you an implicit uh, token to access the element. So uh, you, basically, a OTSUP token is going to be generated, which is going to, which is going to give you programmatic access for 24 hours to the element. Uh, only 24 hours. Then you need the user to pick up the element again or, or do anything. So it just doesn't only let people uh, select elements and know which one they want, for example, to integrate into your UI. Um, it also gives you programmatic access. So you could modify the title, modify uh, the access control list, that kind of things. Uh, there's also, of course, localization. When you load the picker, you can simply set the languages. Here, it's, you could use a way to just set it to French. Uh, you could use the same for to set it to check using CZ. Uh, and as I mentioned already, it also lets you pick from Picasso web album, image search, video search, YouTube, etc. So it's one of the uh, things that we want to launch more in the future. It's basically simple UIs that, uh, I mean, UIs that you can simply integrate uh, inside your, your, your website uh, in a very easy way. So you don't have to, you know, recode that kind of features, use our APIs to build that kind of, uh, of UIs, which could take a while. Um, it's a way for us to just simply let you, uh, you know, add Google Docs feature to your website with, with just a few lines of code. Now a word about our distribution channels. Um, so our main distribution channel is actually the Google Apps Marketplace. So who knows what the Google Apps Marketplace is in here? Oh, pretty good, actually. Um, so for the one that don't know what the Google Apps Marketplace is, um, it's it's the marketplace that we offer for Google Apps um, Administrator to go and find applications to, in to install on their whole domain. So I was actually going to do a quick, quick demo of, the, of this. <clears throat> so this is the Google Apps Marketplace when you open it. And let's say you're a Google Apps Administrator and you're looking for uh, a project management solution. So here I, I've actually already done the search. Let me go here. So you would simply type project management, search the marketplace, and you know obviously it's going to reply. Uh, I mean, return all the project management applications which are available in the marketplace. So these are third-party applications, uh, not created by Google. It's people like you who could create that kind of applications and list it there. Um, a few of the um, of the features they're going to have is uh, at least integrate with OpenID, so so that uh, when people when Google Apps users, sorry, 
open and, and want to use these applications, if they've been installed on the domains, they're going to have a single sign-on uh, experience. So they could just open ManyMoon and not have to, to sign in again. They would already have an account on ManyMoon. They would already be signed in. ManyMoon would know who they are. And ManyMoon, and I mean, the second type of feature they have is the administrator could give ManyMoon access, programmatic access to uh, lots of the, da I mean, data uh, that are that is on Google Apps. I mean, users' data. So, for example, ManyMoon could access the list of um, the list of people in the domain of users in the domain. They could access the contacts of uh, the user that is logged in. Uh, they could access the Google Calendar. So, for example, in a project management application, uh, they could simply create deadlines on your Google Calendar programmatically. Um, so, this is you know some of the features that are. Very, very interesting. So what a Google Apps administrator would have to do is uh, click on that app, and he, if he wants to install it for all his users on his domain, click the Edit Now button. Um, OK, I have to send it again. Oh, application is already installed. Well, OK, too bad. I can't show you the installation process. But what would have happened here is uh, you'd simply have to go through two steps. The first is accepting the terms of service, and the second one is granting um, access to all the user's data. So they, they have to provide a list of the user's data they want to access, for example, contacts, calendar, etc. So if I go to one of the domains uh, where I've already installed uh, the, uh, the ManyMoon application, they could simply go to More, and you could see ManyMoon uh, is available into the one bar, and by clicking this, uh, you would enter Minimoon, you would be, I would be already signed in here. I wouldn't have to sign it a second time. They would uh, use the open ID, their OpenID integration to know. And if I want to create a new project, um, and I want to uh, you know, type, uh, add people to that project, add participants, uh, Minimoon already has access to the whole list of users. Uh, they do that using our APIs because we give them programmatic access when we install the application. So this is a test uh, domain that I have. So you know, all of my users are called test, but ManyMoon has access to all these users. So this is the kind of application that people expect on the Google Apps Marketplace is really tightly integrated applications uh, where you're going to use lots of the user's data already, uh, use OpenID for a single sign-on experience, um, obviously, and um, this is also what people really like about this is they don't have to go and you know, enter the list of their, uh, of their employees again, enter the list of their contact, uh, get a new uh, type of Google Calendar application. Uh, everything would be just integrated with uh, what they have on Google Apps already. Uh, and what's uh, you know, very interesting is people are willing to pay for that. Uh, we have a bunch of, uh, I mean, a actually very, very high number of companies that make a very good amount of money on the Google Apps Marketplace. Uh, here's a few metrics again. We have three plus million businesses. So, you know, businesses, unlike consumer, are usually more willing to pay for applications that are gonna that are you know going to make them save time. Um, and you know, I already mentioned four four thousand new businesses each day. You could calculate how 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 many is that since 2010. So we're way above three million businesses. So. I've shown you the marketplace, the actual features that, that were already launched for a while. Uh, what have launched in the past few months is the following, uh, installable apps for individual users. So we're now going to let individual users install applications uh, on their account instead of letting the, uh, letting the administrator install for the whole domain. Uh, so it's basically almost the same principle, except they're not going to get programmatic access to the whole domain's data. They're only going to get programmatic access to that individual user who installed them. And same thing for a single sign-on open ID. Uh, the whitelist is only going to be done for that individual user. And we launched also a, a bunch of improvements. Uh, we now have staff picks featured on the home page, um, improved search and relevancy. Uh, now search terms are reported to the Google Analytics integration that we have with the, the vendor page. Um, and you can now see install counts in the vendor console. So let's do a quick summary of uh, what we've seen today. Uh, we've talked about, talked about the 100% cloud vision that we have for businesses. Uh, we've seen that Google Apps is not just, part of, is not just the solution. Uh, it's part of the solution. So we want applications uh, that you guys are going to build 
to you know, provide solutions that we don't provide for all the business needs uh, that companies, modern companies have nowadays. Uh, there's also lots of tools available to let you do this. Uh, apps APIs like tasks, contacts, and calendar. Uh, you've seen apps script for automation as, and workflow. I invite you to come to my apps script talk, which is uh, in, three, in three hours, I think. It's, apps script is actually really cool. There's going to be lots of demos. Uh, it's a you know, really fun way to very quickly automate your workflow or build missing features inside Google Docs or Gmail. Uh, so please, please come to my talk. There's also, we've also seen easy Google Docs integration with the Picker API, and, and we will hopefully launch a lot more of this in the future, lots, lots more similar things. And we've seen the distribution options via the Google Apps Marketplace. So a um, bunch of the resources you could use to, uh, you know, to get started or uh, to start an integration is, first, you could go to the Google Apps Marketplace, see what kind of apps is available there. Um, there's the Google Docs uh, forums, I mean, the Google, all the Google Apps forums. You can access them through code.google.com slash Google Apps. Um, please also follow us on our blog. There's a lot of very, very cool articles uh, on our blog. There's external companies who post about, um, you know, how they integrated, I mean, their developer experience on Google Apps. Uh, that's where we post, I mean, blogs where, where we want to link to new technical articles that we just launched, for example, uh, one of the latest one was how to use OP OS2 on tasks, uh, with tasks on an Android platform, uh, that kind of thing. So uh, please follow us. The, we, we send new blog posts very, very often, actually, uh, almost every day. And all the Twitter accounts, uh, you should if you want to follow us, is uh, mine is at Nifco. You have Stephen Basil and uh, Ryan Boyd here. Ryan is a uh, Rigu Rirg. Uh, weird name, Ryan. <laughs> um, those are the developer advocates. Scott McMullen is the program manager. And uh, you know, we have the role account for Google Apps DevRel, uh, Google Apps Dev, I mean, Google Apps Developer. If you want to follow uh, that account, we, we post uh, you know, all the main uh, launches and, and a bunch of new things um, on Google Apps Dev. Also, as I already mentioned, we have a Google Apps, uh, Google Apps Script talk later on today in three hours. And there's the Google Open ID, I mean, the Open ID and OAuth talk by Ryan, uh, I think just after lunch, right? Yes. Uh, and thank you very much uh, for, for coming here. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, and I'll be happy to take questions. And I know people are a bit shy here. When I went, came to Web Expo, people were shy. So I'm actually, gonna, I'm actually gonna give goodies to people who ask questions, especially to the first one. Here we go. So, uh, yeah, do we have a mic? No. Is this working? There's no mic, so you're going to have to yell. So. Uh, yes? There's no problem, no problem. Oh, you mean if you. Uh, patch or oh, patch. Um, you mean especially in the case where you, have a, where you want to use our API through JavaScript? Right, uh, client side. So yes, there is. <laughs> uh, there is a bunch of issues, uh, as, and, and even you know sending cross, I mean cross domain, uh, cross domain request. Uh, if it's not a GET request, if it's like POST, etc., it's it's not always very uh, very easy, and especially patch. I think is pretty much impossible. Um, what we're doing right now is building a client library, a specific JavaScript client library. Um, hopefully, I, mean, I can't tell you when it's going to launch, but uh, I can tell you a bit of uh, how it works. So it's actually going to use a gadget uh, that's going to be embedded in, inside the page, uh, and it's going to use a Java, JavaScript API in between your page and the gadget. So instead of sending the request directly to our URL endpoint, you're going to send the request to the, to the gadget, which is embedded inside an iframe inside your page. So there's going to be a a very specific uh, ways to do that. Uh, I can't give you more details because it's, it's not, I don't think it's launched yet. It should be how it works. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's going to be possible and very easy to do when, when that launches. Yes, and, and you're right. It's right. going to be uh, sold in uh, Chrome also, also. In? In Chrome, in the, in the browser. Um, I can't tell. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. 
I can tell for for yeah for specific methods like patch or that can I, I don't know. You would have to ask one of the Chrome guys. I can uh, point you around. Okay, I mean, thanks. no problem. And oh, I almost forgot. Okay, come here, come here. You can choose your gift because you're the first one. <laughs> No, not the laptop. <laughs> this one. Is, <laughs> you have the plus one pins. You have the Android uh, thingy Android here. Plus one. Okay, cool. And here you get a sticker as well. Okay. Any other takers? Here you go. So yes. When you plan to open some possibility to share a uh, script between projects? Oh, when? Soon. <laughs> Soon. I know it's not possible right now. Um, right now, the only thing, yeah. There is no way to share an app script between, for example, two spreadsheet or uh, to if you have a spreadsheet to apply in, an app script to it. Um, yeah, that's one of the limitations we have right now, and I know it's been worked on. Um, so hopefully this will be available uh, at some point. Right now, the only thing you can do if you want to copy a script is um, is when you copy a spreadsheet, you will get the script with it. But that's the only thing that's possible uh, right now. You want a gift? Yeah? No, 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 please, please. <laughs> okay, you can choose the one you, the one you want. The Android or, or the Pimps? Ah, here, you have a plus one uh, big sticker. Yes? Uh, you show us uh, the examples of uh, applications uh, yeah. that are binded to Google Apps. Yeah. Uh, are you speaking about the last one, for example, ManyMoon, uh, yeah, yeah. that runs on the Apps Market? Yeah, that, that's available so, on the Apps Market, please. Okay, but uh, are, they, are these applications stuck with... Uh, Apps or um, can, you know, no. Usually, how, how, how and I think Ryan has knows them very well. Usually, they would have both. Um, they would um, they would have a. I mean, most of them, right? They have a standalone application that has uh, options to integrate with Google Apps, okay. but they can also run in a standalone way. And they have implemented like a specific Google Apps integration, like OpenID. For example, if do you know Tripit, maybe. Yeah, yeah. You know Tripit, right? So on the Tripit page, you can create an account or you can log with uh, a, Google, a Google account and a Google Apps account. That's the exact, uh, I mean, that's one of the uh, examples, right? They either you create, I mean, you use Tripit in a standalone way or use the, they have an open ID integration. Um, and for example, do you know Aviary? A, Aviary is kind of like a drawing thing, like a drawing thing on the cloud. You can create business cards or draw things. and. Um, so they are completely standalone, but they've created an open ID uh, integration and a Google Docs integration. Like when you send, when you save your image, uh, it's it's saved. In, I mean, it appears in the list in the Google Docs list. You can see the Aviary, uh, um, the Aviary, uh, you know, file and click on it, and it opens Aviary. Um, so that's the kind of things they have, and they also have like a standalone way. Okay. Which one do you want? Uh, I want the <laughs> Just the sticker. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, any other questions in the room? Yes? Uh, I have a question regarding the upstream. Yes. Is it possible to go uh, external to this? Yes, yeah, definitely. You should come to my talk. <laughs> uh, no, hopefully, yeah, yeah. It's the, so we offer ways to connect to, um, I mean, to either do a, an HTTP request, so URL fetch, uh, you can also do a, I mean, we also support JD, there's a JDBC connector, uh, and there's a SOAP connector as well. And the URL fetch one also supports OAuth1 APIs. So you can access, you know, open APIs or simply fetch a web page or even have, have an OAuth1 integration. I mean, access OAuth1 protected resources. Yeah, you're welcome. You want uh, something? Okay. <laughs> Yeah, if you're too shy to take something, you can t come afterwards. <laughs> okay, anybody else uh, has a question? Maybe. Ah, second one. You don't get a gift for the second question. <laughs> um, question regarding the yeah. uh, spreadsheet uh, API, because yeah. through API I can uh, search some values, but if I use that uh, spreadsheet via uh, mm -hmm. methods in the app script, I have the possibility to uh, search some particular... To s search for like a field or... Well, all I can answer then is uh, we will improve <laughs> in the future. So, uh, yeah, you can search through App to Spreadsheet right now. But, uh, you know, it's, uh, AppScript is a very young platform. So hopefully they'll add all the missing features. And, um, and to be fair to AppScript, there is some features that are available in AppScript uh, that are not available externally. Like, uh, 
like the Gmail API or some of the finance stuff you can do in using the finance API, which is deprecated using GData. I mean, the GData version is deprecated. Sorry, I think we're almost done. <laughs> it's going to be the last questions, uh, the last question. And um, yeah, so uh, AppScript is, you know, a little. It's its own platform, so it has the, its own APIs that are built, and there's some stuff you can do in GData uh, that you cannot do in AppScript, and vice versa. So, but hopefully you file a feature request and we build it, right? <laughs> okay, okay, cool. <laughs> all right, so thank you very much, everybody. The time is over. You should all go to lunch now. Uh, thanks very much, and show up to our AppScript session and our session. Thank you.